<coughs> if you would um, like to follow along in the reading of God's Word, if you would turn to 1 Corinthians chapter <coughs> 10, <coughs> excuse me. First Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to be reading verses 14 through 22, but we're going to be looking specifically at uh, verse 16. And let me just mention this evening that we are looking at, um, at the Lord's Supper and uh, something that uh, there's a great variance of opinion on within the church in general. Uh, I already mentioned one of those uh, differences as far as how often we observe it. But also, as far as, as what it means, there's a lot of um, terminology in the Bible that, that just seems odd to our thinking and has caused uh, some churches to go particular directions that um, we wouldn't agree with. Uh, as a matter of fact, one passage I'm going to read this evening may also lend itself to the idea that when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're actually eating the body of Christ and drinking his blood. But, but that is not what we're doing. Uh, rather, we are sharing in what it is that Jesus Christ has purchased for us through his life and through his death. Well, we're going to be looking at a number of these things, but just um, kind of hold on because um, there's, uh, like I said, there's a number of things we want to look at uh, that the church uh, in general disagrees on, but um, we'll see how it is we look at it, at least in this particular church. Let me go ahead and read for you 1 Corinthians 10, 14 through 22. Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. You judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord in the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? Now again, I picked this up in the middle of a narrative, and I didn't read the entire chapter, but Paul is addressing the idea of idolatry. And uh, what a sin it is, of course, to be involved in it. But this passage does remind us that um, there's a lot of worship going on in the world of various things. There is only one true God, and we ought to worship him. All the other gods of the peoples are idols. All the other gods are demons. There are not many ways to God. There is only one way to God, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. This passage also reminds us, though, that if we go that particular direction and share in the things that these people are doing. In the case of some of the Corinthians, uh, actually eating uh, meat sacrificed to idols as though it is sacrificed to an idol and therefore becoming a sharer in that worship or in that sin. That's something that we are not to share in, especially being the Lord's. What we share in is the blessings that our Lord Jesus Christ has given to us. We are just to eat, as it were, from his table. And uh, again, we're going to want to see something of why that is. Let me just begin by saying this, that this is just part of the series we've been looking at on how to die to our sins, how to overcome that corruption within us, that evil desire, and to do what is right, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in order to do that, there are several things that God has given to us, and we've been looking at those lately. We do need to pray, as we saw the early church committed themselves to pray. We need to pray continually. We need to pray in faith, apprehending the promises of God. The more time we spend with the Lord, the more we're going to be like him. God actually gives us the help of his Holy Spirit through prayer. 
We also need to be reading the words, but again, not just to sort of knock out the chapters that uh, we have in our Bible reading program to make sure we've read our four, you know, our four chapters per day if we're using McShane's reading program. And, okay, I've put my 20 minutes in, and I've, I've used this means of grace, therefore I must be stronger spiritually. No, we need to read the Word of God with faith. We need to receive what it says. We need to embrace the promises and, and apply those in prayer. We need to embrace the commandments and submit to those commandments that we might um, serve the Lord and honor him. Tremble at the threatenings. Believe what the Bible says. Uh, so we receive it in faith. We act upon it in faith. We live what the Lord is actually telling us to do. That's how the word of God becomes a means of grace, how it strengthens us. We've seen that we need to devote our lives to worship the Lord, not just on his day, which he calls us to set aside, to spend with him, not just in the worship services where we meet for an hour, hour and a half to worship him, but all of life is to be a continual act of worship to the Lord. As Paul told the uh, Roman church, we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. And again, what that means is we are to be full-time Christians, devoting ourselves at all times to do the things we know are glorifying to the Lord and to do what it is he calls us to do for his glory. Sadly, I think most believers today see Christianity again as just a compartment, as something I do on Sunday, and perhaps it modifies the way that I live the rest of the week. I don't want to do things that are really bad, and, but I still kind of pursue the things that I want to do. And then on Sunday, I, I sort of kick back in and I want to serve the Lord again, but really we need to serve him all the time. Our whole life is to be a continual act of worship, which means we need to cut off the influences of the world, stop seeking after the things of the world, stop seeking, as we saw this morning, glory from the world, and instead seek the glory that comes from God. And then we also saw last week, I believe, that we need to devote ourselves to fellowship, to that ministry that the body of Christ has to itself, to build itself up. God has given to us faith, he's given to us love, he's given to us gifts, and we are to inspire one another by exhibiting that faith, we are to encourage one another through that love, and we are to use the gifts God has given to us to serve one another that the body might become strong, that we might be able to do what the Lord has put us into the world to do. Now this evening we're going to look at one more means, and that is uh, the Lord's table. Again, I already mentioned Paul is warning his readers to be careful what it is they become sharers in because at whatever altar you eat, you partake in everything, as it were, that is on that altar. He points out that the nation of Israel are sharers in the sacrifices that are offered on the altar that God gave them in their old covenant system. Sadly, in their case, they have a share in sacrifices, which the author to the Hebrews reminds us are offered over and over again because they can never take away sin. So they have a share in sacrifices that cannot save them. He says there are those too who have a share in the altar of demons. Uh, Paul says that really there is no such thing as a false god or as, uh, there are demons of course, but there are no, uh, no other gods but the true God and what they are actually worshiping are demons and they are committing acts of idolatry and they have their share in that sin and that judgment that God's actually going to bring upon those who worship false gods. It certainly doesn't honor God if knowing that he is the true God is all due through the creation that they lower him to the level of a creature and worship that creature and say you're the one who made me. Uh, the Bible says that that is very offensive to the Lord, and he will judge them for it. If you sacrifice or share in the altar of a demon, you'll also share in that judgment. And by the way, I should say the same thing is true of the world. If the world happens to be your idol, and that's the altar that you're participating in, as it were, you'll also have your share in what happens to the world in the end. John warns us not to love the world or the things of the world if you do, you'll perish with the world. But if you love the Lord, you will live forever with him. So be careful what it is you love. Be careful what it is you worship. Be careful which altar it is that you're participating in. 
Now, the good news is that if you're a believer, the Lord has provided an altar that you can share in that I don't want to say brings eternal life because it's certainly the life is not coming through the table, but it certainly reminds us of the means of eternal life, and it certainly confirms to us the fact that we have it. We're going to look at that a little bit more. Now, on this altar, we don't have a continuing sacrifice like the altar that Israel shares in, and we don't also look at the table as a continuing sacrifice. I, I mentioned that there are many different views of the Lord's table in various uh, historic Christian churches. Uh, Rome, for instance, believes that every time the Mass is observed, that Jesus Christ is sacrificed again. But that isn't true because the Bible says that he was sacrificed once for all. It's not a repeated sacrifice, but it is a memorial of the once for all sacrifice that Jesus has made that cleanses us forever from our sins. And as we see in our text this evening, it is also communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this evening, I want us to see a couple of different things that the table is to remind us of. And that is that you do have a share in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done through faith. Now the two things I want us to look at is first of all, what it is you share in, in the table and then secondly, how you are to share in these things so that it may become a means of grace to you. Just participating in the Lord's table will do nothing for you unless you do it in a particular way. Now, first of all, what is it that you're sharing in at the table? That's actually what Paul tells us about in our text in verse 16. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? What is it that we are sharing in at the table? It is his sacrifice. Now again, it's not as Rome believes and it's not as Lutherans believe that what we're actually receiving here and sharing in is the literal body and blood of the Lord. We don't eat his flesh and we don't drink his blood, not literally. But if you'll look at what's been written, even within, let's say, you know, this historically in, in Reformed churches, you will find some, uh, some language that sounds very similar to that, talking about the mouth of faith feeding upon Christ, which sounds rather strange, but again, it's because of the language that's used in Scripture, this, this idea of sharing in his body and his blood. What we need to understand at the outset is that this participation, this fellowship, this sharing, this communion is not literal, it's not physical, but it is spiritual. We are sharing in or communing with the Lord Jesus Christ and the benefits that he has brought to us through his work that he accomplished in his human nature. Now, you need to realize that this is real communion with the real Christ and he is present at this communion not physically, but spiritually. Now, Jesus Christ, of course, in his divine nature can be everywhere at once. He is omnipresent and he can be with us. And we have fellowship with him. He is present here spiritually to bless. He is here to give to us that which is most important to our spiritual growth and that by which, or that which is um, given to us through all the different means that the Lord has given to us and that is his holy spirit. What we lost in the fall was the presence of the Holy Spirit. What Jesus Christ's work does is restore to us the presence of the Spirit in our hearts through his life and through his death. And again, from what we've seen over the many weeks, we understand that we can have more or less of the Spirit of God. What the Lord gives to us through the means is more of his Holy Spirit influence. We don't want to think of, of the person of the Holy Spirit as some sort of a, a liquid or a spiritual you know, substance or quantity that we can have more or less of. We're not talking about having more of his substance, as it were, in our bodies or less. But we're talking about having more or less of his holy influence in our lives that makes us more like Jesus Christ. Now again, 
this is the same grace that the Lord gives us through the other means of grace. When you pray, when you read, when you worship, when you fellowship, you are sharing in the benefits of his death. It's the same grace. It's simply a different channel, you might say. The Lord has, has this one great reserve, infinite reserve of grace, this influence of the Holy Spirit, and there are many channels from that reservoir that flow down to us, and those are the different means of grace. Again, the, the uh, Lord's Supper is just one of many. So it is a means of grace. It's a sharing. It's a participation in what Jesus Christ purchased for us through his life and particularly through his death. Now, at the same time, the Lord's Supper is also a reminder that you, if you've trusted Jesus Christ, that you share in everything that Jesus Christ has done for you. One thing, I, again, that I've mentioned on a number of occasions, but I want to make sure we understand, is that Jesus in his life did not just you know, uh, take our place on the cross, but he actually took our place in everything that he did. I mean, what we needed to get to heaven was a perfect life. And so Jesus came into the world, not as a full-grown adult, and just went straight to the cross and sacrificed, and we were saved by that particular act. If that's all that was necessary, then the Lord could have perhaps formed a, a man, a full-grown man, and had him go straight to the cross, and that would be all that was necessary. But he didn't have him come into the world that way. He had him come in as a baby. He was conceived and born of a virgin. He was raised from childhood to adulthood. He lived a perfect life from the very beginning all the way up to adulthood and all the way through his adult life and all the way to his death. And that perfect life was necessary in order to save us. That life he lived, he lived in your place if you're trusting him. The death that he died, he died in your place. The resurrection that he underwent, he was raised for you. His glorification was for you. This is what we mean when we say that Jesus Christ lived a vicarious life. He lived in our place. This is what we mean when we say that Jesus Christ has become the guarantee that the conditions of the covenant will be met for you so that you can actually go to heaven. He is the surety, the guarantee of the blessings of the new covenant. He has guaranteed them through his life. The Lord's table reminds you that you share in the things that Jesus Christ did. So the Lord's Supper is something in which we, we have a share. We, we share in certain things. We share in those blessings and benefits that Jesus Christ purchased for us, but it also reminds us that we share in the life that he lived, the death that he died, the resurrection he underwent, his glorification. When you trust Jesus as your, as your Savior, this is actually what you share in because when you trust him, that places you in Jesus Christ. And I believe the table reminds us of that. Participation in the benefits and blessings, participation in his very life. Jesus took your place if you are trusting in him this evening and did all that was necessary to save you. Now, that's the first point. The second point is this. How do you receive the grace that God gives you in the table? I mean, granted, it's a sharing in these blessings and benefits. Granted, it's, it's a reminder that we have a share in the life of Christ. How does it actually convey to us the help of the Spirit of God and really... There are several different ways, and it could be wrapped up in the idea that the Lord's Supper is a sign, that the Lord's Supper is a seal, and as a seal, it's also a memorial. It is to remind us of certain things. Now, again, uh, when we're talking about a means of grace, we're talking about receiving the Spirit's influence, gaining his help. That's what this grace is we're talking about, the help of the Holy Spirit. The more you have of his influence in your life, the more that you will be like him, the more you will be like the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's think about how we receive that grace through the table. Now, it shouldn't be a surprise that this grace comes to you in the same way that it comes to all the other means. 
There is something that God must give you first before you can benefit from any of the means. You have to have faith. Okay, faith is how we receive anything God gives to us. It's not just belief, but it is trust. And we have to see how that applies here as well. I mean, if we consider the three parts of faith, faith is knowing what is to be believed, believing that those things are so, and then actually acting upon that belief and receiving what it is God promises, we need to know in the Lord's Supper that grace is offered to us. By the way, in, in most evangelical churches, you'll find that there's no reference to this as a means of grace. They don't really see it as a means to receive anything, but rather to remember. And it is important that we remember, but it's also important that we know that there is something here that the Lord intends to give us, because if we don't know, we're not going to look to the Lord for it, and we're not going to receive it. Now, Paul tells us here that there is a sharing, a participation, a communion, a fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ as we come to this table and celebrate it. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? There is a sharing that goes on here. Knowing that, you have to believe it. That's something I believe the Holy Spirit has to convince you of, that there is at the table a real participation and sharing in these things. And then thirdly, you need to look to Jesus Christ for that blessing by faith. Now here is where we look at the Lord's table as a sign. You know, we talk about sacraments being signs and seals. First of all, let's consider the fact that it's a sign. Now, as you know, a sign is not the reality. A sign is something that points to the reality. If you use the illustration, if you're driving, let's say, south and you're heading towards Los Angeles, you know, you're looking at the signs and you're, you're seeing that, uh, okay, Los Angeles, 300 and something miles, Los Angeles, 200 and something miles, and so forth. When you see that sign, you don't say, oh, I've arrived in Los Angeles, here it is, the sign, and you stop at the sign and, and your trip is over. No, the sign is only there to point you to Los Angeles. It is not Los Angeles until you get to the one that says, welcome to Los Angeles, you know, that type of thing. Then when you pass that, you know you're there. Well, in the same way, the Lord's Supper is, is not the reality. It's not the blessing. It's not the grace itself. But it points to the one who gives you that grace. It's meant to point you to Jesus Christ. It's meant to get you to lift up your eyes to Jesus who is in heaven and to look to him for this blessing. You see, if you look just at the bread and if you look just at the wine or the grape juice and you focus just on that, on its appearance, on its taste, on its nutritional value, have I, you know, how much have I eaten and do I gain any benefit from this, you, you miss the whole point. If you focus just on the sign, but don't look at the reality, the purpose of these, these elements here are simply to get you to, to look beyond them to Jesus Christ himself. You need to look to what they actually represent. Jesus says, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. I gave my life that you might have life. Now, here's where we get into some of this uh, tricky language, too, because Jesus, in a certain sense, the way he represents the, the, the table and, and some of the language that's used, that Paul's using right here, and that was used by Jesus as he spoke to his disciples, is true. There is a feeding here. There is a communication here. There is a looking to Jesus Christ as the manna that comes from heaven. There is a looking to him and a spiritual feeding, as it were, upon Jesus Christ. Now, again, I wouldn't use that language, except the Bible uses that language, so we have to make sense of what it means. Jesus said to his disciples some things that we have a very difficult time understanding, at least the church has historically. He says, my flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up 
on the last day. Now that, again, we were sort of struck by that language. We can see maybe why Luther believed that there was real body and blood in the elements, so why Rome believes that the elements are transformed from bread and wine into body and blood, and why they believe, at least Rome, by eating this, that you actually receive his flesh and blood, and you actually receive grace or life by eating these things. We don't believe that you receive life by eating these things, and we don't believe that you're eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and yet Jesus Christ meant something by that. What he meant, of course, was a spiritual feeding. When he said that, he was still very much whole. He had not yet gone to the cross. When he says, my flesh is true food, nobody reached out and grabbed a finger and tore it off or tried to take a bite out of him, right? Because they realized that he wasn't speaking literally, but he was speaking symbolically. In some sense, he is the bread from heaven. In some sense, we have to feed upon him. We have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. But he can't mean literally. Certainly, it never happened in a literal way. So he must mean symbolically. I mean, Jesus is the manna from heaven. He's not literal bread, is he? And yet, he is the one who is the bread of heaven that brings us life, that if we eat him, we will live forever. But this feeding is something we do by faith. And again, why some of the old confessions would say something like this, that the mouth of faith feeding upon Christ. He is true bread. And we are to feed upon him by faith. We are to look to him. We are to trust him. We are to receive from him our life. And we are to receive from him everything we need for life and godliness. He is our source of spiritual life. Certainly he means that. And he doesn't mean that we are to eat him literally. So we look beyond the sign. And by the way, the signs he gave to us are things that we eat and drink. Isn't that interesting? But it's to point us to the fact that we need to feed upon him. We need to be nourished by him and by his grace, just as the bread and wine nourish our bodies. So Jesus is life and nourishment to our souls. So how do we receive this help that he gives to us? Well, he's offering this help. He's provided it through his life and through his death. And he offers it to us if we will simply look to him and receive it by faith. This points us to him. He's the one who has it. He's the one who gives it. So we have to look to Jesus Christ. If you're looking just here, you're not going to get the blessing. You have to look to heaven where Jesus is. You have to look to him by faith and receive it. Now, there is one other aspect of the table that I mentioned. There's a sign and there's a seal. The table has another purpose, and that purpose is to confirm your faith. That's what a seal does. It confirms the reality of something. The Lord, by giving us the table, is confirming something, something he wants us to know that is true about us. And I believe what it is is that we are safe in Christ, that having fed upon him by faith, we have eternal life. That if you have trusted Jesus Christ, that everything that he has done has become yours. That through his life, you have a perfect righteousness through his obedience. By his death, you have an atonement. You have a payment for your sins that cleanses your sins once and for all. That you are perfect in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you are to know that this is what he says in the table. This, this is what you are to believe. This is what you are to receive by faith and apply it to strengthen your assurance. By the way, I believe that that's the reason why the Lord wants us to remember him. As he says in 1 Corinthians 11, where we typically read to institute the Lord's table, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my blood which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What is it we're supposed to remember? Well, we're supposed to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. Now, by the way, when the Lord is constantly pointing to his death, and the, the death on the cross is the climax, as it were, of his, of his ministry. It is that one act that the Bible often points to 
that saves us, and yet we know that it's not just the cross, but everything that Jesus did and continues to do that saves us. But this is that, you know, that uh, figure of speech, as it were, that, that um, device that's used in literature where you have a part for the whole. This is the part that represents the whole, the death on the cross. Jesus wants us to remember that, but I do believe he wants us to remember everything that he has done for us and to know by faith that what he did, if we are trusting him, he has done for us. And so the fact that he's gone on before us means that we will actually arrive where he is in the end. Now, again, his life was vicarious. Everything that he did, he did in your place. So when you look at the table, you are to remember these things. And these things can also be a means to strengthen you spiritually. And we've seen some of those ways as we've been going through this series. For instance, when you look at the table and remember the death that Jesus Christ died, he died for you, he died to cleanse you of your sins, but remember that when he died, he didn't die just for himself. The Bible says that we died with him. If we are trusting in Jesus Christ, we died. What that means is not just that uh, we're never going to die again. It doesn't mean just that our sins are forgiven, but it means that we no longer live. We died with him. We no longer live to sin. We no longer live for self, but we live for him. Basically, well, we, we died to sin, okay? The idea of his being raised, you know that Paul says that when he was raised to life, that we were raised with him. And now that we have been raised with him to newness of life, since we died to sin, we are now to live in righteousness. Again, we are no longer to see ourselves as belonging to ourselves, but we are to see ourselves as belonging to him, alive from the dead now, just to serve him. That follows along with what it means to be a full-time Christian. You know, we, we are to be living sacrifices to the Lord, not just on Sunday, but every day, not just part of the day while we're having our, our worship, while we're reading our Bibles or praying, but the whole day is to be offered to him. <coughs> so when he was raised to life, you were raised with him now to live only for him. But again, there's, there's more than that. Excuse me. <coughs> Just getting over the cold. There is also his ascension. <coughs> Jesus Christ, when he was raised from the dead, he did spend a bit of time on the earth preparing his disciples for uh, what was coming ahead. <coughs> but then he ascended. And he didn't ascend just for himself. He also ascended for you and me. And the fact that Jesus Christ is in heaven, the Bible also says that we will one day also <coughs> be in heaven. In order to apply that, you need to see that when we look at the table, to know that Jesus Christ has overcome death and he's been raised again to life and he lives in heaven, it means that we don't have to be afraid of death either. That one day we are going to enter into heaven. We are going to make it because Jesus Christ is there. Jesus Christ was crowned. He, it was, when he ascended into heaven, it was the day of his coronation. And because he was crowned, the Bible says, when you die and go to be with him, you will rule and reign with him. His coronation is, in some sense, for you. His glorification. The Bible says because he was glorified, one day you are going to reach final glorification. <coughs> and then with regard to the inheritance, what Jesus Christ inherited because of his work, he inherited not just for himself, but also for you. In other words, what Jesus inherited, he inherited for you. All that Jesus did, he did to guarantee that you would qualify for this heavenly inheritance of the new heavens and the new earth. And because he has, if you've trusted him, you will also receive it. You will also be there with him. Again, the Lord's table reminds us that we are sharers in all of these things, and we need to receive that by faith. I mean, how do I know I'm going to overcome death? It's because of the death of Christ. How do I know I'm going to make it to heaven? 
It's because Jesus Christ went to heaven. How do I know that I'm going to rule and reign with him? It's because he's ruling and reigning. How do I know that I'm going to be glorified? It's because he has been glorified. And again, that's how I know I'm going to receive the inheritance. And how do I know that it's always going to be mine and that I'm never going to lose it? Because of Christ's unchangeableness. He lives forever. He never changes. His promises will always be true. He is always faithful. And because he is, you and I will live forever. Now, these are the things that we are to see by faith when we come to the table. Again, we are to know that these things are true. We are to live in the light of them. This is what the Father is reminding us of in the table. He, he reveals these things to us. He seals these things to us. He's the one who instituted the table as a part of worship in order to confirm the promises to us so that we could be certain that we are going to receive these things in the end. By the way, there is one other thing that the Lord wants us to remember, and that is the reason why he did all these things in the first place. When Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, he does want us to remember that all he did to bring grace to us, all he did to save us, and that all he went through, he did for us. But he also wants us to remember his love, which is another means to strengthen our faith, to know that the one who created us, and even when we fell into sin, sent his son for us, he loves us, and he will never stop loving us. So we are to remember that love and let that love encourage us to love him in return and to do what he calls us to do. So the table is a means of grace. It points us to Jesus Christ, the one who purchased these blessings for us through his humanity. It points us to Jesus Christ that we might feed upon him spiritually, receive his grace, receive the help of his spirit. It, it's meant to confirm to us the promises that God has made, that they are all yes and amen through the Lord Jesus Christ. They are confirmed to us once and for all. Jesus Christ, because of what he's gone through, has guaranteed that the blessings would be ours and that you will receive the blessings, not only the blessings that, that he has for this life, but also the blessings that he has in the life to come. Again, the Lord's table is meant to confirm all these things. Now, one last thing I did want to note, and I already mentioned this at the beginning, and that is that this is what the Lord's table signifies. That's sort of the technical term. It's what it shows us. And it's what it seals to us. But the table itself does not actually give us these blessings. I hope you understand that. Uh, life doesn't come through the table. Uh, when Jesus says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, we don't understand that in a literal way. We don't understand that the way the Roman church understands it. We don't just eat from the table and receive life. It comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to trust him and turn from our sins. If you've done that, you have everything the table represents. You don't have to participate in the table to receive them. The table is only meant to confirm these things to you, as well as to provide another way to receive the grace of God. So all of that is to say this, that if you're not able to participate in the Lord's table because you haven't made profession of faith, you haven't trusted or for one reason or another, you haven't been received as a member in a church, it doesn't mean that you don't have these blessings because these blessings don't come through those avenues. The blessing comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've trusted him, then everything we've just talked about belongs to you because it comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. On the other hand, don't let that stop you from making profession of faith or becoming a member because the Lord gave the table as a means, again, of blessing to uh, point you to Christ and to confirm for you or to you his numerous blessings. 
You know, the interesting thing is, and, and again, this is one area that perhaps Reformed churches differ from broad evangelical churches, is that this is the one means of grace that the Lord withholds until one becomes a member of the church. And I think the reason he does this is because he wants to protect the holiness of the table. Uh, the one thing about the Lord's table is that, that Jesus Christ actually calls this by his name. Uh, Paul refers to it as the Lord's Supper. There's only two things in Scripture that, that have that word, that particular word that's used there, Lord's, attached to it. This is one of them, and the other one is the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day is particularly you know, uh, uh, dear to the Lord Jesus Christ because that's the day he rose from the dead. That's the day the early church worshipped because he rose from the dead on that day. That's the day we worship because he rose from the dead on that day. It's a day that belongs to him. Well, the supper also belongs to him. And it's something that he wants to give just to his people. I think in the fact that it's such a vivid portrayal of his whole life. I mean, you know, some churches have pictures of Jesus all around. They might have a big, you know, stained glass picture here or big crosses and things like that to remember the Lord Jesus Christ and his life and his death. But there's really only one thing that the Lord has appointed to display that in his church, and it's really the Lord's table. This is something that represents his life. This is something that is holy, and it's something that the Lord intends that be given to, as much as possible, those who are holy, who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, he's given different means to convert. He's given the word and prayer. He's given different blessings to build up worship and fellowship. But this is the one that, that tends to confirm what he has done to us. And so before he gives this to us to confirm it, he wants to make sure that faith has been confirmed by those whom the Lord has appointed to examine that faith. That's the reason why we, um, well, in, in Reformed churches in general, uh, we want you to be received into the membership of the church before you actually come to the Lord's table, to be examined by the elders so that the examination is not just self-examination, although that's very important, but that your profession of faith has been examined by an elder as to its genuineness, at least as, as much as can humanly be done. Uh, does a person believe the right things? Do they profess to believe these things? Do they have a life that's consistent with these things? If so, they are welcomed into the fellowship of the church, become a part of the church, and they are welcomed to the Lord's table. So this confirming sacrament, as it were, this confirming means of grace is given after that faith is confirmed by the elders. And again, we believe this is an exercise of the keys of the kingdom of heaven, where uh, the Lord says to Peter, I you know, give you these keys, and whoever sins you have forgiven, they will have been forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, they will have been retained. And what he means by that is by examining those who seek to gain entrance into the visible church, not the invisible church, not, you know, not salvation, but to a local fellowship. If you examine them and determine that they've really trusted, then as, as you allow them to enter, you're declaring that their sins have been forgiven by Christ. And if you hold them back and say, you know, no, it doesn't appear to me that you have been saved, then basically what you're saying is your sins haven't been forgiven. You haven't gained entrance into the kingdom, or at least into the visible kingdom. <coughs> so it's a part of the exercise of the keys of the kingdom of heaven, either to gain admittance to the visible church or not. And again, let me remind you, it doesn't, it's not talking about actual salvation because no one has the right no, humanly speaking, except, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, either to allow or not to allow into the eternal kingdom of heaven. It's the visible church or the visible expression of that kingdom. And, of course, we can be wrong. People that are excluded may actually be saved. People that are received may actually not be saved. But we try as best as possible to make that examination. So, again, I, I hope you understand at least something of how... The Lord's table is a means of grace and how it can strengthen and nurture your faith. I'm finding as we celebrate it week by week that every sermon naturally 
leads right into the Lord's table because it is connected in some way with everything that the Bible says. And we can't show all of those connections tonight. We just know it's connected to Jesus and everything is connected to him. But what the Lord wants us to do is he wants us to remember Jesus Christ. He wants us to look to him for this grace. He wants to confirm to us that what Jesus Christ has done, he has done for us so that we are saved. And I believe he wants us to look at the different parts of Jesus' life and to realize that the things that he went through, that he went through for us, have a bearing on the way that we live. We don't live in sin anymore because we died with him. We live to righteousness because we've been raised with him. We have the hope of heaven because he's ascended into heaven and so forth. The table is to remind us of all those things and we need to apply them, receive those things by faith. So let's, with, with that in mind, let's spend a few moments in prayer and let's ask the Lord to search our hearts and to help us to repent of all of our sins, that we might be prepared to come to the table to remember, to feed upon Christ, and that our faith may be confirmed in him.